good. You guys must be found in your way here. That's good. I promise you. So kidney stones, huh? Let's talk kidney stones. Let's not destroy that. All right. Um, so let's see here. To this question, which is a very real question. There, there are two camps of nephrologists in the world. Nephrologists are kidney doctors. Um, there is a camp that says individuals that have one functioning kidney will have a lower rate of stone formation because there is effectively less surface area, right? I mean, there's like less place for stones to grow. You got half the size, effectively. Um, which, you know, logistically makes some sense. There is another camp, though, that says, no, 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 the pathology of most stones, calcium oxalate stones in particular, is that they are brought on by the inability to expel salt, for the most part, sodium, at the end of the day, I and mean, that's the major driver here, um, largely, for calcium oxalate stones. And so if you have one functioning kidney, you get an even higher buildup, and so therefore you'll actually have an increased rate of stone development in that one kidney relative to having two. Um, because you're overworking it to some degree. And then there are other folks that say, well, it's not going to change either way. Um, so, thinking about the sampling scheme, what do you guys got for me on this one? If you want to answer this question, how do your data allow you to do this, or what are the limitations of it? Tell me a little bit about it first. Well, we're sampling from, I think, patients who are or the ill in a sense, right? Okay. So, and for being treated. So that's definitely not a general situation. Okay. So certainly they have a history of stone disease, right, Arsini? I mean, that's, that's what the specialty of that clinic actually is. And I just gave away the second part of the sample. Which is what? So Everyone's one part of the clinic. It's one clinic. This particular clinic is probably the most famous clinic for stones, for treating stones in the world. So usually when you have that reputation, what types of patients do you get? That's a little bit on selection bias, right? Thinking about who we might be able to generalize to, where we're going to generalize to. So we have a very select group of individuals here that we're, we're thinking about kind of on the extreme side of stone formers um, that have been previously treated in the past. What else in terms of the sampling scheme, though? 
One thing that seemed odd to me was that he had um, even gender breakdown in the one kidney group mm -hmm. uh, and not in the two kidneys group. So I was wondering if that was something odd that occurred in sampling. They they searched for an equal number of females and males. Yeah. Um, the answer is no. There was nothing special that was done to try and balance on gender, say, for example, among those that have one functioning kidney. Now, it does turn out that there is, and we will talk about this later, there is an interaction in the rate of stone development by age between gender and age. And what I mean by that is at younger age levels, if anybody did some background reading on this problem, who has higher rates of stone development among younger individuals, just in general, in the population? If you look at any kind of reports, you will see this. Other? It's males? It's males, yeah. So males tend to have higher rates of stone formation in the general population at younger ages. But what happens is as the populations tend to grow, females catch up with respect to their rate of stone development. And you can find that fairly, fairly quickly in the literature. And so those individuals that have single functioning kidneys, there might be some confounding there by age, in other words. Okay, so you want to look at kind of whether once you condition out their ages, Um, what are the things on the, on, the, on the sampling scheme, though, in terms of like the data collection? I mean, as you think about this, was it, would this be your ideal way to answer this question? I mean, no. <laughs> so what's wrong with it? Well, the condition is like well, we basically observe it. We don't impose it. We don't randomly assign kidney. So it's observational, certainly, in nature. Is there a well-defined starting time here? I mean, when you guys get into studies where you're thinking about time, time is, is, is part of this question, right? Does everybody agree with that? I mean, Follow-up time is an inherent part of being able to answer this question. And so whenever you're involved in a study that involves time, one of your questions should be, what is the origin? And is it a well-defined origin? So for example, if I had done what Arsenia is saying, I won't talk about it as randomizing people to stones, because that's just cruel, but <laughs> if I were taking stone formers and then randomizing them to treatment, yes or no, and starting to follow them, I have a well-defined origin, which is the start of treatment, right? In other words, I can think about what's happening in stone formation as I'm moving out from that anchor going forward. Okay? Or, you could say, I mean, if you're in an observational study case where you're trying to, char to characterize this, what's another thing that you might be trying to anchor upon in this particular case as you're thinking about stone development? Maybe the time at which the first stone developed in a patient? I mean, in other words, again, think outside of the box from what you actually got. Would it be a cleaner study design if you had identify each patient at the, at the moment that their first stone had been diagnosed and then started to follow them out? Is that cleaner than what you guys have right now? Yeah. Why? Yeah, Francis. Isn't that what we have? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because you don't really know true full medical history. You think you might, but you don't necessarily. The reason why is because you don't know kind of what happened in the past. You can't control for those latent characteristics, right? And so you have no concept of what's going on with respect to that. So there's some arbitrariness, or somewhat arbitrary. Origin. The flip side of time. What else is kind of a, an odd thing about your particular the duration of follow-up, follow right? Or, so, Arnie, what what do you got for duration of follow-up? I think we're anywhere from one year to thirty-two years. Okay.
it's not standardized. What do you worry about when duration of follow-up is not standardized? So maybe they develop stones at first and then nothing happens. There could be that, right, or seeing, but there could be another type of bias that could come into play, right? I follow patients that develop stones at a higher rate longer than I follow patients that don't develop stones, right? I mean, that, that should be coming into your mind here. If that is the case, what are you going to see? You're going to see an inflation in their stone rate development, right, among individuals. You're going to basically self-selecting and following longer those individuals that are continually developing stones. So again, the way that you would deal with that by design, if you're able to, is you'd say, no, 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 I'm going to force it so that I'm following everybody for four years. You know, I'm going to do that a priori, so regardless of whatever their stone rate would be. Okay? But you do not have that. What's well, another kind of limitation I would argue that you have with this particular study? Some of us have talked about this in in office hours as well. I mean, if I were collecting these data, this would not be the exact data that I would collect. Yeah. You make more uh, so you don't know when Sorry. the you don't know when the stones happen. Yeah. So basically, the problem we were talking about in office hours was um, <coughs> that you have changing rates as you age. So. Um, Great. That could be. So, with Hina, was that what you were going to say as well? Uh, or did yeah. you want to add to that? Oh, it's just that we're assuming that the rate's constant. It's better if you collect. It's pretty much what similar, but yeah, yeah, I like the idea of the assumption of a constant rate. So, so there's no information. that implicitly, this is going back to Hina's point, you're implicitly making an assumption of a constant rate of stone development. Right, because if you think about when you guys computed those rates, you said, I'm going to take total number of observed stones, I'm going to divide by that by the total number of follow-up years, and maybe I'll multiply it by 20. So then I'm going to talk about the expected number of stones that one would see if you followed an individual over 20 years. But what you just did implicitly was said, I'm going to make, I'm going to assume that that rate is constant. And so whether I would have multiplied by 1, that would be my, my rate of stones over 1 year, or if it's 20, it's going to be 20 times that. You guys with me? And this goes back to Arseni's point just a minute ago, which is, how do we know that? Maybe stones are developing higher early on, and then they come down. Or maybe the rate of stone development within a subject is growing over time, potentially as they're aging. Okay. So all of these things are things that I would raise as I'm discussing the study design here and what I've been able to measure, everything that I've got here. And in fact, the true data analysis for this that I have, I actually have the time in which the stone developed. Um, I didn't give them to you because I wanted you to. But, um, so if you had the time at which stone development, stones developed, then you could do a much more refined analysis. You could actually think about the time until stone <coughs> developed and compare that across people with one and two kidneys because then you are implicitly dealing with that fact that the rate might change, right? The underlying risk <coughs> might be changing as a function of time. Again, you guys do not have that. You are dealing on the aggregate level, so every interpretation that you make at the end of the day is going to be subject to that particular limitation. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, we also don't know whether 
for those that, that lost a kidney, we don't know if that happened before or after their first kidney stone. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is the So. We're going to get more into, there's a lot we don't know, actually. Yeah. Um, but certainly, there's additional information that would need to be collected. observed covariates even in this case. I, I don't know much about this, but I, I would assume that maybe people might get rid of it. You know, a, a kidney might fail if uh, stones are developing. But I don't yeah, um, it turns out I actually wrote a paper on kidney function and stone development. Yeah. And it doesn't really necessarily destroy a kidney, it just lowers the uh, the efficiency of the do, kidney. For lack do, they, of do they ever get rid of a kidney that is producing a lot of stones? No, no, no that's no. kind of, that would be, that would be a big trade-off. Yeah, there's a lot of pain <laughs> there, yeah, that would be a big trade-off though. No, they, that, that wouldn't be the case. So most of the people, so we'll get into this in just a second. Um, actually, let's, let's go ahead and start this right now. So multiple things on the study design here that would bring forth limitations. Do I think that the data are worthless for starting to address this question? No, I don't think they're worthless, but I think you have to point out the caveats of what you're dealing with here. Yes, sir. Yeah, just to clarify, so do we really assume that uh, the rate of stone development is uniform in a sense, or do we assume that it might be not uniform, but this not uniform is like uniform across the patients in a sense. So, so what I mean is, um, like for example, we definitely assume that it's not the case that for all patients there's uh, an increased period in a certain amount, like in, in a certain age. But maybe we assume that maybe it won't break anything if there is this increased period, but it happens to be in different, uh, like intervals in time for different patients. Right, but the point is, is going again with the, the, the stochastic follow-up time, right, that you have in your study. If I follow a patient for the first year and they're at a tenfold increased risk for rate development versus if I follow somebody for 30 years and the remaining 29 years, they're at one-tenth of the rate of stone development. And I'm marginalizing over those two, basically, and I'm averaging across them. Now, everything is, I and I, I'm going to try and, I'm, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to interpret your question a little bit more. Once I adjust for things, then I can condition upon the patient type. I don't have a lot to adjust for here. In other words, I have their number of stones, I have their age, I have their gender, basically, is what I can deal with in this data set. But then it becomes kind of, again, assuming an aggregate or marginalized rate conditional upon those values. I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, the number itself is right. I mean, it is the average number of stones developed over a given period of time. The point is, is that it leaves out a big portion of that story, right? I mean, you guys know a lot about distributions now. What is the continuous form of the Poisson distribution? What is the continuous analog here? Memory list property, constant rate, exponential. exponential. Thank you. So there, again, you fit an exponential model to things. You assume that there is a constant rate that is occurring as a function of time. What you're doing is marginalizing over all time. Okay? Now, that rate might be changing. So is that the correct, is that right? Yes, that is the right marginal rate. But it's just not telling the complete picture, which is that it's time varying truly as a function of time. And you can't pick up on that. And where it could get run into problems is that now, if my follow-up was correlated with my number of kidneys, the thing I'm trying to answer here, then I've got an issue, right? Because now I've got inherent confounding in terms of how I've, how, how long I've followed those people for and the fact that I'm aggregating their, their uh, stone count over a particular follow up time. Okay? And if that rate is changing, then I'm upweighting certain individuals over higher risk periods of time based upon their co rate values and downweighting others. So you think about it like that. Okay. So now let's think about this concept of an a priori model specification. So some people ask, again, what, what do I mean by a priori model specification? When I say that in the context of applied statistics, what I mean is before digging into the data, so to speak, I know I asked you guys for descriptive statistics before that, but I really want you to think a little bit outside of the box in terms of if you're trying to answer this question, what should you be adjusting for in a model? 
So if you live in my world, which you guys are all welcome to, it's not it's not always bright and happy, but um, you guys are all welcome to. Um, there are really kind of what I'd argue is four types of adjustment code rates right in the world. Things you have to worry about. So what's the first one you have to worry about? Confounders. Okay. Number two. Number three. And then there's like this fifth one that I call nuisance, but I, you know, hopefully you're not trying to, to deal with those and bring them into your model because what the effect of the nuisance variable is it's going to increase variability, right? It's going to decrease your precision on being able to answer a question. I mean, really, you can break things down for adjustment into these categories. So that's what I'm asking you guys to do. I asked you to do that on the final last year. I asked you to do it all through 211. Same thing holds here. If you're thinking about confounding, stone development, the rate at the end of the day, then I'm thinking about what here? This guy going this way, and this guy going this way, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I will already start off, at least in my idealized mind, as saying, what types of things predict the rates of stone development? I mean, that's, that's where you begin. Because if this holds and this doesn't hold, you're there. So guard against that. So now, anybody want to start laying out things? And the concept here is not to think about what you have measured in your data set. It is too easy to fall in the trap of sitting there saying, I need to think about adjustment variables from the things that I have observed. Do not do that because that corners you and it corners your thinking and you will not be able to identify limitations of your study. So let's think a little bit more outside of the box. Yeah, Frank. Uh, the sodium intake? Absolutely, that's number one. Anybody find any kind of anybody doing any reading and see that these things are interacting? Interaction here again it was what I just described earlier. Males tend to have higher stone forming rates when they're younger, <coughs> i.e., pre 50 55. As you get past that age, females catch up quite a bit. Anything else? <coughs> so, how much water you drink? <laughs> Absolutely, no, the water thing, absolutely, it's tied to the sodium, but I hate to tell you this, but, you know, basically where we are with medicine for stone development, like that, that, that poor guy that has 60 stones in there, you want to know what his prescription most likely was? Decrease sodium and drink a lot of water. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of what your prescription for medical care is under six or seven. From the clinical the best reputation for kidney stones? That's pretty much it. I mean, that's where we know. Now, there are certain genetic stone forming types, and then those ones we can kind of treat. But I believe that that person with 60 stones is what we call, again, a calcium oxalate stone former, which is kind of from sodium, for the most part, sodium buildup. And so there's really not a lot. There's actually stone formation is what led to, do you guys know that there's something in the United States called the salt belt? Mm -hmm. Heard of this? So if you take, it's kind of the lower southern part of the state, or of the United States, I should say, going across kind of 
New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, that portion of, of, the, of the country called the Salt Belt, where if you look at the stone formation rates, they're like two and a half times higher than the rest of the country, both below and above. And basically a bunch of epidemiologists, nutritionists, epidemiologic nutritionists have over years kind of measured what people are eating, so it's all salt. Right? So it says water in some strange language. Anything else? We just go change genetics. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely hereditary forms of stone disease. So what what did we what did you find? Did you find anything for other kidney diseases? I just uh, think about like the, the, the kidney function. Yeah, it turns out that kidney function doesn't necessarily produce stones. <coughs> Treatments for stones kind of can produce decreased kidney function though, right? So how do you deal with the stone? Does anybody know how did anybody read on how somebody deals with the stone? Yeah, Francis. Mm -hmm. uh, Pass it. Yeah, that's one way. If it's small enough, you pass it. Okay, that's like a painful route. It's all painful, actually. <coughs> one is to pass it if it's small enough. If it's too big to pass it, yeah, so it's called shockwave lithotripsy. And so basically what they do is they take sound waves and they pummel the kidney, basically, and then they break the stone up. And so I've written a couple papers where looking at kind of people's exposure to shockwave lithotripsy and then at the end of the day looking at their kidney function, you can see that their kidney function drops because what happens is you're pummeling their kidney, you're not just messing with the stones, you're kind of killing nephrons as well. Your kidney is made up of millions of what are called nephrons that basically filter your blood. Um, it doesn't, not to the point where you get kidney failure necessarily, but it's definitely decreased, you can see it. Okay. So I don't know if, if, if underlying renal disease, though, brings on stones. I don't, there's never been any kind of that temporal sequence. It's more so treatment for stones lead to poor renal function. Anything else, though, here? You can kind of put it into genetics, but certainly there are race and ethnicity, and that's probably confounded also by diet. Okay, but there are definitely racial and, and ethnic differences in stone development. And the calcium is true. That's because you get this calcium buildup over the formation of the stone. Yeah, obesity has been linked, certainly. Again, A lot of that, most people would argue, starts getting heavily confounded with diet. Okay, if you're going through maybe something like exercise, uh, I don't know, increased blood flow. Maybe yeah, not so much the exercise itself, but blood pressure actually has been linked to stone disease. Okay, and again, it's kind of flow of the blood through the kidneys and then build up and cleansing. So uh, hypertension. some supplements also. Yeah, so that's a big one actually. Um, medication. Right? I mean, when your body goes to clear a supplement, any other kind of medication, it could be natural or it could be you know, pharmaceutical. When your body goes to clear that, you're clearing it through the liver and then ultimately the kidneys, right? So, and that has, basically there have been associations certainly between medications and stone development in those cases as well as in Okay, so that's, those are kind of the big risk factors, actually. I mean, if you go read, yes. Uh, real quick, how do we differ between hereditary factors and race slash? Yeah, that's, I, I said that, right? Okay, I said you sorry. can kind of count that into genetics. But the, where I'm kind of pulling it in is because it's a cultural thing, too, right? I mean, it's kind of a diet type of thing as well. So it's not necessarily genetic there. So, yeah. Um, so definitely these two things are obviously tied to Um, so those are like the big risk factors though if you look at the literature. So what do you guys have measured? <laughs> there you go, right? So 
You got those two. Yeah, that's, that's basically it, beyond your predictor of interest. And so the reason why you want to do this stuff is because, okay, now tell me the things that might be linked to the number of functioning kidneys that I have. So, as a part of diet, yes. Okay. What else? What leads to poor kidney function and ultimately loss of a kidney? Well, age. <laughs> age is that, I, I always, you know, it's never a good thing, right? Only in wisdom. We get this great wisdom. Calcium and water? Um, certainly water. Calcium is more of a byproduct, actually. So they give calcium supplementation when people's kidneys fail, as opposed to it kind of breaking down the kidney. Certainly there are genetic factors that are linked to kidney disease. Glomerular nephritis is like the number one, right? Runs through families. Now, does that have anything to do with stone development? I have no idea. I don't think anybody else does. Okay, so I'll start right now, but there's obviously lots of factors that would go into genetics here. Okay. Well, medication perhaps is well. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> So is the gender like, like the gender? Yes and no. Um, it's up in the air. What you know, it, and it again depends a lot on socioeconomic status and the age of individuals. But it turns out hypertension. I'll just give that one to you guys. That's like the number one cause of renal failure in African Americans. Right? Okay. okay. BMI kind of loosely been associated, again, race, ethnicity, sticking in with, um, there's definitely differences in terms of kidney failure across different race, ethnicities. It could be tied into genetics, could be tied into diet. It gets kind of messy when you're thinking about these things. The key thing is, is that just about everything that we wrote up there is a potential confounding factor, right, in what you're looking at here. There's another big one, though, that goes along with this. I've been talking about renal failure. It turns out that when you lose a kidney due to renal failure, you usually lose both kidneys, right? When, when, when people's renal function goes down, <coughs> it goes down, okay, across both kidneys. In other words, you end up on dialysis. You end up on some sort of um, artificial, if you will, cleansing of the blood to attack just the kidney. And so, so the, yeah, friends. So they transplanted the kidney, and the doctors felt that they were healthy enough. <sighs> yeah. So you can lose, you can certainly lose a kidney due to acute renal failure. Okay, so in other words, you have damage to a kidney. This does happen, and you lose a kidney. But more than likely, the people that have one kidney, for instance, is coming because they gave one up to somebody else. Okay, so in that case, that's a whole different set of ball games here, right? I mean, those are now exactly as Francis said. Those tend to be more healthy people. So now it's going the opposite way, right? It's people whose blood pressure tends to be under control. It's people whose weight tends to be under control. Sodium is always in good shape and things like that because they have high functioning kidneys. They're able to actually donate a kidney off to somebody else. Somebody feels comfortable enough with taking one to keep both. But again, it kind of works in the opposite way. It's like the things that are helping the kidneys, right? As you're going. You have no information on who had acute renal failure and only has one kidney, or who donated a kidney off to somebody else as you're going through. Okay. That's a very messy thing. So if you were doing this by study design, obviously you would want to know why somebody has one kidney. Okay. And then potentially stratify them out is what I would do. Because the person that has one kidney because of acute renal failure is likely to be very different than the person that has one kidney because they gave up a kidney for a donor cause. Okay, so again, if I were doing this analysis just as, a, as an overall general training exercise, and I'm thinking about all of these concepts, these all go into my limitations and in introducing my data and my study, okay? This is our job. No one else in the world is going to think about an analysis like this. And what I mean by that is outside of this, the statistician slash analyst. Most people are not going to look at this and think confounding precision effect modification. 
It's just not going to happen. Okay. So when I was referring to the cause of having one kidney, I'm only really referring to it as an effect modifier, by the way. That's why I was saying that those two people are likely quite different. Okay. Okay. Good. So I'm we can all sit back and say, well, I don't know anything about this area. When you start analyzing data in an area, you better start to learn about it really fast because you're the only one that's going to be able to figure it out in terms of being able to parameterize the problem in this way. Okay. All right. Good. So now, take me through a few things in terms of descriptive statistics. I'm just going to list down some of the things that you guys did. So Nina said, man, descriptive statistics, you can get as creative as you want to be. The answer is absolutely. The whole point, though, is to become creative in trying to describe your sample population and to elucidate, if you will, the scientific question of interest to somebody, right, in very easy terms in these concepts of compounding. So what did we do for descriptives? Table of summary statistics. What was it? Table of summary statistics. Okay, so you're going to have to be much more specific for me than that, though. Summary statistics. Like mean medians, okay. um, splitting those with one kidney and those with two. Okay. So hold on one second. So we've got measures of location and spread. So location being, quote, unquote, central tendency is what you described to me. Um, and then anything on extremes? I hope somebody did, right? Do you guys at least characterize the range of stones that you observed on people? Yeah, okay. So, so they saw what was going on there. Okay. Now, the question though is when you're thinking about these summary statistics, now you said stratify them by number of kidneys. Good. I mean, there are a couple of, of kind of go-to descriptive statistics. If you've got a predictor of interest, stratify out your summary measure by the predictor of interest. What do you get out of that? What are you trying to explain to somebody when you do that? So when I sit here and I go with Sasha's recommendations of describing central tendency spread extremes, and I do that now by patients that have one functioning kidney and those that have two functioning kidneys, I am letting people know about what? Marginal associations. I'm letting them know about marginal associations, but I'm highlighting the fact that in order to make a fair comparison, certain things are likely going to have to be adjusted for, right? Because I have differential distributions between my predictor. It goes back to compound at the end of the day. But that is the quickest way to illustrate to somebody that when you say, okay, all my people that have one kidney are 65, roughly, plus or minus five, and my people that have two kidneys are 40, I'm making these numbers up right now, I'd better start to adjust for age if I'm gonna make a fair comparison in rate development, stone rate development between those groups. But that's, that's about as quick as you can do it, right? And, and just show that side-by-side -side comparison that's going on there, okay? Good, what else? Well, we can look at what happens at different level, like number of uh, kidney stones. Actually, the, for example, mean age or or the distribution of age for every hospital across stones. Or what I might say is distribution <coughs> of stones. Certainly, by number of kidneys, as a descriptive analysis, right? So in this case, kind of a nice thing you might do is just a stratified histogram. Right? I mean, show me what the distribution of stones looks like among people that have one kidney and two. Again, it's descriptive. You're trying to elucidate what the relationships are here, but also describing what's going on. When you guys looked at a histogram for the number of stones, what did you find? <laughs> Absolutely, right? You saw this massive spike sitting right at zero, and I think your median number of stones certainly was zero. I think it goes up to about your 70th percentile, actually. Okay? About 70% of your patients, I think, roughly. 
had zero stones. Um, why is that important? You guys just did two problems on the last homework assignment where I talked about basically a zero inflated type of Poisson model, that negative binomial model, right? Some people have propensity to develop stones and some people don't, right? It's an underlying prevalence that's there. So you've got something already, at least when you look at it marginally, it's not conditional, but even if you start conditioning and stratifying on sex and age and number of kidneys, that does not look Poisson. I don't care if you standardize it by the follow-up time or not, you still get this lump of zeros and you get things falling off very, very quickly. It's what we call a zero inflated count, okay? And so, the problem with that is, relative to what we talked about last time, so first of all, you don't know what that latent variable is. In other words, I, I think I was talking to Arnie about this, and he said, well, could we not just model prevalence of stones, yes or no? The answer is yes, but really what you care about is among people that have observed zero, some of them truly may, fo may follow a Poisson type of distribution, and some of them may have zero risk. In other words, their, their Bernoulli, their latent Bernoulli is just a zero out there. And you have no information on that. It's latent, okay? And so that's the problem. And so all you get to see is the marginal counts across these things, okay? So one possibility is to think, start thinking negative binomial, but if you see that histogram, the first thought through your mind is, Poisson assumptions unlikely to hold in these data. We're going to have to do something about it. And if you guys have listened to me, you get count data, that should be the first thing that goes to your mind before or after a histogram. I don't care. You, know, you get count data, it's unlikely to be Poisson distributed. Unlikely. Okay. Starting place, fine. Unlikely to be truly Poisson. Okay. Um, anything else that you guys did? Any, any kind of. Who got creative? Mm -hmm. That's it? Okay. Well, I will tell you this. For those of you that are taking the applied data analysis exam at the end of the year, if you want a piece of advice, spend a lot of time on descriptive statistics. And really thinking about them. And I'm not, I'm not talking about just filling up pages with averages and typing summary of your data set. Really thinking about describing your study sample in your data set to the reader. Because I tell you right now, it's Oftentimes, 80% of the battle, you're getting people to understand what's going on with the data. You know, once you fit your model, you've got a point estimate that comes through. But where students often fall down on that exam is they usually just type summary. You know, in which case you get a summary of ID numbers. Which I could care less about, right? You get a summary of all kinds of things that you care less about, and they don't really highlight the important <coughs> aspects of what they're, what is leading them to make decisions about their model and approach as they're going through. When you're stratifying by the predictor of interest, that is telling me what your decision process is for the modeling approach. You're identifying confounding factors that are occurring. If you want to look at effect modification, if anybody do any descriptives on effect modification here? I told you one in the literature, and I think Arnie spotted it as well. Age and gender. So what would I need to do there? Well, perhaps table like a, like a cross table. You could do cross tabs with that. It's going to start. You're going to hit the curse of dimensionality. So you got to be kind of careful about how you're doing it. So what you might do is stratify by gender. That's two categories. And then just look at the empirical rate of stone development across the ages by those two genders, right? So in other words, take observed count divided by follow-up years and standardize them out, but then link them across the different ages. That's a classic kind of effect modification plot that you might want to think about if you're trying to explain to somebody, we see we've read about this in the literature, and here it is coming to fruition inside of our data set, which it does come to fruition in your data set, okay? So think long and hard about that. I want to get real quick to a couple of plots when you guys actually got into the analysis. So based upon what we talked about and what we've actually measured here, my model included obviously the predictor of interest, age, gender, and then the interaction between age and gender. Okay. Hopefully this is going to work. Oh wait, I'll be next. I actually plug it in.
see where that goes. Um, who started off by fitting a plus on one? Um. Okay, good. Okay, fantastic. I did as well. And, oops, let me go back up. So this was my plus on model that's sitting here for you guys. A couple of things about this model as I go through. Some things that I did, right? So I have this thing that says I age minus 40. Why would I do such a thing? Interpret the intercept. Yeah, I'm doing it because when I interpret this estimate for sex, which this exponentiated relative risk ratio says that there is approximately a 32% decrease in the rate of stone development comparing females to males, I'm doing that among individuals that are age 40, right? If I didn't do that, it would be among individuals that are age zero, okay? So that's why I'm doing that. I'm giving some interpretation to what that particular guy is. Again, if I were doing this for a report, I would be kind of putting this together in a table and kind of illustrating what exactly what I'm doing here. This is kind of my shorthand of this. So I went through, I fit my Poisson model. We talked a little bit in office hours with folks about age here, and I've done that as well in this particular case. Age is a little tricky here because you have the entering age at the time of follow-up for people, but then you have highly variable rates of follow-up. Some individuals you followed for 32 years, Arnie told me just a minute ago, some individuals for one. Well, if I try and control for age in that case, and I take two individuals that came into my study at age 20, one of them I followed until they were 21, and the other one I followed until they were 52, that's not really a fair comparison and adjustment for age when their rate is kind of changing all through the ages as I'm following them through. So really, you're stuck a little bit in this case. There's nothing perfect. You need to know the time of stone development to truly deal with that problem. But probably a more reasonable approach, take their average age over the course of follow-up. So in other words, you know their age at the beginning, you know their age at the end. You can say, on average, when I was following this person, they were, in that particular case that I had there, they're going to be what? They're going to be 36, okay? That person I followed to 52. All right, so that's a little bit more of a fair comparison. So hopefully some of you guys thought about that as you were trying to adjust that age. Now, if you fit that Poisson model and then you do our nice little square Pearson residual plot, this little thing down here, this red line over here, that's one. That's smoother for everything else is kind of the average squared Pearson residual. If my Poisson assumption were correct, I'd be floating right around that one. No way, no shape, no form. Not on these data, right? So again, you guys would be amazed when you go to the literature, how many people would just fit this model? Oops, hopefully this comes back on. And just reports that inference. That inference is totally incorrect. I mean, it's totally incorrect at the end of the day. If you fit the quasi-Poisson model, what was your over-dispersion parameter for these data you're estimating? 13. 13. What is that telling you about those standard errors? They're off by a factor of root 13. Okay? That's huge in terms of overestimating the amount of precision that you have inside of your data. Now, does that look like a quasi-Poisson model, though? If it was quasi-Poisson, this smoother should be kind of slope zero and above that, that one line, right? That, that horizontal line at y equal one. So this does not look like it's quasi-Poisson. I think you could make a case for saying it might be something like negative binomial just from a heuristic standpoint, and that's because you have all these zeros stacked up, right? The way you get to the negative binomial model is this concept of saying you saw it where you have this latent random variable that's out there that gives you a zero or gives you a Poisson distribution. You guys derive that down for me. And that'll give you a shape of a negative binomial. That's one form of it. You also saw the gamma form of it in the random effect model. But if it were really negative binomial, what would be the variance function? You guys derived it. It looks something like mu times one plus alpha mu is what my notation was, right? In which case, if I divide through by my Poisson assumption, which is just mu, I just get a 1 plus alpha mu left over for this plot, right, if you think about the squared Pearson residual. In which case, I'd see something kind of like a line, right? That doesn't really fit that either. Yeah. Could they actually use this plot to test it directly in the sense that the, fitted, like, the model is different, right? So we need to fit it first and then 
then it'll be a little bit better. Yeah, it, it's not going to be, if, if you do this yeah, and look at the square root term, it's not going to be that different, actually. But yes, you, you can go back, go back, fit the negative binomial model, and then see if you're on the line y equals 1 again. Right? So that would be one way to do it. Okay. Um, I think the key point here is that to me, that doesn't look linear. And if you've refit the negative binomial model, it's not going to look like that either. Go ahead and do it. I mean, promise you. Um, it does not look like some scalar over dispersed model. The answer is, I have no idea what the underlying <laughs> data generating mechanism is for this. I have no idea what the mean variance relationship is that's sitting here. I couldn't tell you. Okay. I, can, I, I can postulate certain things, but I, I do not know. And so, we've got a robust variance estimator, and in this case, you've got 1,450 patients, right? Mm -hmm. If you went back to your negative binomial data that I have <coughs> used for a homework, And you looked at the results of the quote unquote empirical or robust range estimator, that's coverage probabilities that are sitting there. And your target again is 0.95. That's under negative binomially just, um, generated data. What was the sample size for this? 150. Right? 150 was what it was in this particular problem. You got 10 times that amount of data. Okay? That thing is going to converge way down. You don't have to worry about what the underlying shape of it is. And so. Hopefully some of you guys did that, thought about it, and if you do it, um, that's the quasi-fit, that's the robust fit sitting there. That's my predictor of interest after I've adjusted out everything. Um, again, take a look at the width of those confidence intervals now once you've started to adjust for the over dispersion that you're seeing in that data, and then you've got to go with that guy. Okay? I did fit the negative binomial model. The results are actually not too, too different. But if you ask me to do this in practice, I mean, it's a no-brainer for me. I'll just take the one that's an empirical estimate that's going to work, right? I mean, we call large numbers a fantastic thing. So. I have a question. Yeah. If right. the coefficients did dramatically vary between the Poisson and the negative binomial, and you fit the robust variance to both of them, which one would you go with? So if they dramatically vary? Yeah. So will they dramatically vary in large sample sizes? And so I have to pause. Uh, the mean model is the same. The mean model is the same, right, Arsini? What does Hubert White tell us? Uh, uh, you're talking to me. That's <laughs> it. Um, uh, basically, that the, it will both converge to the It'll converge to the, the true parameter values that make the expectation of that estimating function equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Right? What did you learn about the negative binomial model and the Poisson model in this case? They both, when you look at their score, their estimating equations, they look like what? So they're a function of y minus mean. They're going to converge off to the same parameter values. So your question is a little bit of a trick question because you give me a large enough sample size, these things should all be consistent with the same quantity. They're going to go off to the thing that makes the expectation of y minus mu equal to zero. So for small and medium sample sizes, what you would do is you would probably just report those models and then figure uh, What is your definition of small and medium? you got to give me a little context. Well, I mean, like for this case, yeah. you don't really have uh, uh, I, I don't know, like the number of kidney, the number of patients for kidney and the number of kidney one, and you have, you have, you have obviously two other factors. Uh, yeah. Um, there's, that, that's small to medium. In, uh, like, this case? I mean, I had you guys simulate data with 150 observations and two covariates last time. You saw really good performance with the robust range estimator. What, what I want you to do, and I want every I want to challenge everybody in here, take your simulation studies and start ramping down in. You, you gotta look at the empirical performance of these things to to basically convince yourself of when they're gonna start to break down. So I'll I'll quantify my answer a little bit better for you, Francis. If you'd given me a sample size of fifty patients here developing stones, I would start getting queasy about using the robust range estimator. I would probably, in this case, if I saw that Pearson square residual plot, to be quite honest with you, I would probably go with the negative binomial model. Because that thing doesn't look quasi at all. I mean, it's, it's like this, right? I mean, it does not look like a scale factor. And that's, that's <coughs> kind of way off from that, in fact. 
So this would be one case where I would actually probably, and I can, you can look at the histogram and kind of see this spike at zero, and I know that that's how that variance form kind of arises, right? So you can derive it. And so I'd probably be going with something negative binomial if I was in a sample of size 50, but I would be writing a caveat that says, this is all based upon the assumption of having this latent binary term that's sitting out there, right? And, and the inference is based upon that. But if I'm up above 50 in this case, and again, I want you guys to look at the simulation results on this, that, that empirical variance estimator is going to start to stabilize. And it's going to do it pretty well. I mean, assuming I don't have also 50 covariates in my model, right? I mean, you, you, are, you are using information across the covariates, but I'm talking about the case that we're sitting at here. That would be working just fine. Yeah. When you start getting into small sample sizes, though, you're, you're forced to rely upon assumptions at some level. You're starting to have to come back to some assumptions, whether it be a simple scalar over dispersion model, whether it be something likelihood based like the negative binomial. In some way, you're going to have to do that because large sample theory is no longer going to work for you. Just taking averages and assuming that they're going, they're consistent. Well, consistency usually doesn't apply to n equal 20. Okay. So, okay. so we'll leave it at that. Hopefully, you guys learned something on it, and we will pick up tomorrow.